Okay, so uh, today's panel is uh, Inequality in Institutions. I'm just gonna briefly introduce each panelist, um, and then each panelist will talk for about 10 minutes, and then we'll go into um, Q&A. Uh, from my left to your right, uh, first up will be Desmond King, who will be presenting work uh, that he has done with Roger Smith. Desmond King is a professor at University of Oxford. Um, next to him uh, is Robert Kuttner, co-founder and co-editor of the American Prospect. Uh, next to him uh, is David Brian Robertson, uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis, also a professor as well. Uh, and then the discussant for the panel will be uh, Paul Peterson. Uh, Paul Peterson. I'm sorry. I'm sure you get it all the time. <laughs> Whoops. Um, Paul Pearson, uh, professor of political science at UC Berkeley. So first up will be Des King. Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much for the um, for the invitation and uh, the opportunity. I, I realize that my next job, I want to be at Cornell University, since it seems to have such a brilliant faculty and graduate students. Who can? There's so many of you come. Yes, you may. <laughs> um, so when I came through the uh, airport at Dulles yesterday, the uh, border guard, as usual, said, uh, why are you here? I said, I'm going to a conference. And um, he said, oh, yeah, what's it called? So I said, a republic, if we can keep it. And he said, no worries. We've got the right guy in the White House. <laughs> so I decided I wouldn't go any further than that uh, in the discussions with him. Um, and I'm on my own. I'm sorry, it's a, it's, Roger Smith should be here, but of course, getting from Philadelphia to Washington is such a long way compared to coming from Oxford that uh, he wasn't able to make it. But nonetheless, we'll, we'll do our best. So um, the, I'm just going to have some slides to try and summarize what I'm, what I'm going to say. The, the, the work builds on what Rogers and I have been doing for about over a decade which is arguing that the, the uh, US electorate, a key aspect of the dimension is between uh, what we call a uh, race-conscious policy, racial policy alliance, that is those who believe in using civil rights and advancing civil rights to uh, make progress on some of America's historical uh, inequities, and a colorblind coalition, which um, racial policy alliance, which is, takes the opposite view, thinks that racial issues are gone and there shouldn't be any uh, progress on that basis. Um, this, we've argued in work that this sort of di dichotomy extends through, throughout American history, but that in the last uh, two decades, it's, it's taken on a distinct characteristic, which is the extent to which it's overlapped with the parties, with the political parties. So whereas previously there were race-conscious and colorblind uh, advocates in both political parties since the um, 19, well, certainly since the 2000s, um, it, this division, the internal division has really gone and the parties are pretty cemented in each way. And this, this intensified during the eight years of Obama's presidency, um, as Michael Tesler's uh, work has, has shown. Um, but broad, and, and this, this memo comes from a paper where we tried to ask the question, did, did the 2016 election seem to fit this pattern? Uh, to which we answer yes, and it's become uh, even more so. Um, now, we're not arguing that race is the only dichotomy dividing the American electorate, but certainly saying it's, and I noticed even E.J. Dion yesterday agreed that uh, the racial component was very important in the election, but we are saying it's, it's a really significant one, and in some ways it's got more significance since uh, 2016. Um, so the, the, roughly the, the, uh, the alliances are between um, GOP members on the colorblind side, various presidents, Supreme Court majority, uh, some senior um, uh, um, bureaucrats, and on the other side, the Democratic uh, office holders, presidents, liberal Republicans, some federal state judges. Um, and um, these are some other parts of them, some traditional white unions, conservative think tanks, um, fringe white supremacist groups. We use the word fringe before 2017, but it seems to me it probably needs a more central role than it had then, and then various cons conservative think tanks. And the other side are these, uh, now the large unions, liberal think tanks, liberal media, and so forth, which are c still espousing a commitment to uh, uh, race targeting or race conscious types measures. Um, and oh, sorry, I'll go back. And that, that's that's meant to be really the um, 
the two co the two sides that came to fruition in the 2016 uh, election between these two the two groups on on each side. Um, race didn't feature overtly that much in the campaign, but it certainly v featured implicitly. Um, and uh, um, if you look at the party platforms of the Trump candidacy, the Republican Party versus the Democratic um, Clinton one, you'll find that they have very standard positions on things like affirmative action against or for uh, using federal authority to increase uh, integrated housing for and against and for schools and so forth. So there's a clear distinction of policy views. Um, and now, taking this a little bit further, there's been an awful lot of discussion today and yesterday about the um, relative lack of change in policy outcomes and institutional resilience and continuity under the Trump presidency. And I'm going to argue against that in respect to civil rights and argue that, in fact, the colorblind agenda on which Reagan and uh, uh, Trump and the Republican Party was elected has really been pushed quite substantially forward in the last um, 14 or 15 months. And examples of this are first on voting. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but there are, I mean, the Republicans, of course, have been attacking voting laws for two decades, and it's, it's really coming to fruition. One interesting thing is this Ohio registration culling, uh, which the Justice Department has, um, uh, it's, it's now going up to the Supreme Court, and the Justice Department has issued an amicus curiae brief with it. There's all the stuff about the uh, census that you've heard about. There's supposed to be a commission investigating the election, but I would emphasize also the, the decade before the uh, ID changes. Another key area is housing. Um, and Ben Carson was always, always a peculiar choice to be uh, HUD secretary, since he, he, he certainly wasn't interested in it or, or very aware of it. And, and what he's, what's happened is that some very significant changes to the, um, particularly in the, uh, the responsibility for affirmatively um, bringing about integrated housing, desegregated housing, have been stopped. So Obama got through a very important rule in 2015 called the Affirmative, Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing, um, which, which imposed various conditions on local um, governments, uh, state and local governments who receive HUD money to ensure that they were satisfying um, uh, the conditions of the, of the federal grant. But this is a long-standing issue with HUD. It hadn't been doing this since 1968. There are various cases before, but this was quite a tough new rule, and that's gone. It's been suspended. Uh, and also, there's quite an important change to the uh, uh, small area fair trade market rule about housing cho choice vouchers. Um, so the, the rule in 2016 provided subsidies on rents appropriate to zip codes. So housing choice is really one of the most housing vouchers are one of the most important measures being used to affect the housing market, but the vouchers that were distributed took no account of differential rates across zip areas, and this, this measure was to take that change, but that's been stopped. Um, and then in affirmative action, uh, there are various initiations towards um, uh, uh, universities um, and the Justice Civil Rights Department, um, division, sorry, within the Justice Department, has initiated an investigation of universities' affirmative action policies, and there's the quite famous one about, uh, about Harvard. So, um, and finally, I think this is final. No, sorry, not quite. Just two other areas, I'll say. Policing, there's been enormous change. Um, uh, rolling back of the Justice Department's involvement in monitoring local police departments and reviewing them, like the ones in Ferguson or in Chicago and so forth, after various incidents. Um, and in schools, um, this is really quite, there's a lot going on here that's quite significant. We have a secretary of education who doesn't believe in public schools, essentially, and is doing a great deal to create um, private school vouchers, which always have a racial bias to them uh, in the area. And there's really quite significant school resegregation going on um, across the country, uh, which has been, which predates this presidency, um, but it's, it's taken, um, it's really continuing at quite a, quite a rate. Okay, so in conclusion, thanks, thank you very much, but the argument is to say, what I'm trying to get across is, um, I think in this, this area of, of civil rights and the division between the two broad racial policy coalitions, and they are very broad, and we're not suggesting that everybody who's within them holds the same views, but there are sort of two different approaches which are divided by the parties 
We have extremely high ideological and partisan polarization. But within that context, those who've trumped in this election, who've succeeded, are using that power to push back the uh, civil rights agenda and to enforce a color blind, um, very traditional um, historical agenda. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Thanks for having me. Um, so I have a book coming out this week. It was actually published on Tuesday. It's called Can Democracy Survive Global Capitalism? And uh, it actually connects very nicely to the subject of this panel, which is uh, inequality in institutions. Uh, the argument, very simply, is that uh, democracy and capitalism are always in tension. And uh, when you globalize, when you hyper-globalize capitalism, you make that project uh, more difficult. Uh, the project of harnessing the market system in the broad public interest. That is first and foremost a project of the polity. It's a project of the nation state. And there is no polity at the global level. And at the global level, elites have a much easier time uh, capturing institutions and uh, privatizing regulation and making decision-making opaque. There is no global citizenry. And so to bring this back to the uh, ostensible subject of the panel, inequality in institution or institutions, um, capitalism invariably promotes inequality. It promotes inequality of income, promotes inequality of wealth. Wealth then, a la Piketty, becomes a source of generation of inequality of income. And um, it is up to the democratic nation state to harness uh, the market system on behalf of uh, greater equality, but also on behalf of democracy. And it's either a vicious circle or a virtuous circle. The, the virtuous circle occurs when you have strong democratic and civic institutions, which are able to regulate finance above all. And I'll get to that in a moment but to regulate all the other predatory aspects of capitalism, not just for the sake of uh, greater equality, but for the sake of greater efficiency, because contrary to the standard uh, neoclassical story, the market system, when left alone, makes allocative decisions that are stunningly inefficient and creates uh, periodic booms and busts. Uh, you may get some allocative efficiency out of deregulating finance, but as the 2008 collapse showed, the cost of that was about $20 trillion, and that's a lot of allocative efficiency that it takes to counteract that. And it's not just a matter of uh, regulation. It's a matter of empowerment of trade unions, uh, the great counterweight to uh, owners of capital. It's a matter of uh, empowering government to do things in the public interest, to create public institutions and defend them like public schools. And so when this uh, virtuous circle is working, uh, you have strong democracy, uh, housebreaking capitalism, and you have citizens keeping faith with democracy, keeping faith in government, and feeling that they're getting a, share, a fair shake. When the system goes into reverse, and of course there's agency here, it doesn't spontaneously go into reverse. The story is the story of elites recovering a lot of power that was lost during the uh, New Deal era. But when the system goes into reverse, um, what happens is that people begin losing faith in elites. They begin losing faith in institutions. And if it gets bad enough, uh, they begin losing faith in democracy itself. And if you look back at Mussolini, really, even more than Hitler, uh, the process of losing faith in parliamentary institutions as just futile and useless really uh, prefigures uh, Trump. Uh, so uh, I think to the extent that uh, capitalism generates grotesque and extreme, uh, extremes of inequality and insecurity, th there are two great exceptions to that in the American period. Uh, one is in the 19th century, where because we had uh, heisted a lot of this land from the Indians, uh, land was cheap, and the population was fairly sparse. And that meant that outside of the South, outside of the plantation system, 
you could have a relatively egalitarian distribution of land. That didn't just happen. It took Jefferson's intervention to make sure that land would not be bought up by great uh, land speculative companies. And it took uh, some public uh, investment, a la the, the American system of, of Hamilton and Clay. And it took uh, the, the great uh, uh, initiatives under, under the Lincoln presidency, the Homestead Act, Acts and uh, the land grant colleges, but we had a we had a relatively egalitarian distribution of land, which was the greatest form of wealth holding of that era. And then, of course, you have the the great era of corporate consolidation and uh, increasing concentration, not just of wealth but of of influence. And we have a half-hearted attempt to do something about that in the Progressive Era. It's only in the New Deal and during the war that that's really. Uh, reigned in. And uh, this is an institutional story because uh, this is not just atomized citizens uh, making demands on governments. This is done uh, through, uh, a, if you will, a, a progressive version of pluralism. And we all know the Schatzschneider quote, uh, the, the, the kind of traditional critique of pluralism is, is all too accurate. But if pluralism includes uh, the kind of organizations that Theta Scotchpole has written about, uh, if it includes strong trade unions, then you do have something like countervailing power, and you do have the institutional base for a political coalition that begins to regulate capitalism in a, in a broader public interest. The problem is that the second great era of this, which many of us grew up with, the, the post-war boom, which we thought was normal, was completely anomalous. It was completely anomalous. Uh, look at all the things that had to happen before the, the wartime and post-war era of managed capitalism could take place. I mean, first of all, uh, capitalism had to disgrace itself practically and ideologically with the crash of 1929. Uh, then we had to get very lucky and get a president as radical uh, as Roosevelt. You may recall uh, what happened or almost happened in uh, in February of 1933, where the president-elect is giving uh, a speech in Miami, and a would-be assassin fires five shots at close range and hits the mayor of Chicago instead. And um, had Cactus Jack Garner been president in the 1930s, we would not have gotten the New Deal. So it took an element of luck. And then we had the war. And the prestige of the state, the prestige of the Roosevelt administration, uh, the war doubles down on that. The war is even more important than the Wagner Act in empowering trade unions as legitimate social partners. Uh, the war is very important as, in empowering the state as a benign source of, uh, of public investment. And because the Cold War happens to follow World War II, unlike after most wars, we don't just cut the tax rates, we keep the tax rates very high. And we keep the regulation of finance very strict. Finance was almost a public utility in that era, which meant that it did not have disproportionate political influence and it did not have disproportionate policy influence on behalf of uh, austerity. Uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff call this the repression of finance. Finance was repressed in many salutary ways, uh, and it was especially repressed globally. The Bretton Woods bargain was a deliberate attempt to have a kind of a Keynesian construct globally so that you could have a managed economy at the level of the nation state, and you could have a full employment. Are you nudging me yet? Soon, state by state. So let me cut to the chase. No, I got four more minutes, three more minutes. Um, I'll wrap this up. <laughs> In conclusion, so punchline. Um, globalization was not the sole cause of this being destroyed, this unusual social contract, but it was an intensifier. And the kind of hyper-globalization that we got after about 1980, and especially after 1990, was really used to make it almost impossible for the nation state, the polity, to have the degree of regulation of capitalism that we had uh, in the three decades after World War II. Now, when you take away people's livelihoods, and that's really what's happened, eventually they get angry. And when the center-left party, the nominally center-left party, is part of that consensus, they say, gee, where's the opposition party? I don't see the opposition party on the center-left. 
and then you get uh, neo-fascism. And when you compound this by saying to people whose livelihoods the global elite appear to have taken away by not paying much attention to what happens to decent jobs for ordinary people, and then you compound that by asking the same ordinary people, white people in this case, to open their hearts, open their hearts to transgender people, open their hearts to immigrants. Uh, what happens at the base is folks conclude that the same people who are responsible for sponsoring a version of globalization that is taking away my livelihood, they're the people who want to let in immigrants. They're the people who uh, advocate uh, killing uh, unborn babies. They're the people who disrespect my religion. They're the people who make a big issue out of bathrooms. And then you get Donald Trump. And the reason, and this is the punchline, the reason that this is happening all over the West is not just contagion, it's not just um, imitation, it's not just coincidental, it's systemic. We've had a systemic blight that has destroyed the ability of the nation state to harness capitalism in the public interest, and hyperglobalization has been its instrument. So can we get democracy back? Yes, but it will take strong democracy once again to uh, leash uh, hypercapitalism once again. Thank you. Well, thanks to the organizers and to the um, to Cornell University and Suzanne and all of her colleagues. The task at hand for me is to try to make federalism a little more interesting than it often is. And the difficulty of doing that somewhat is allayed by the news from different states like California each day. Here's one that I got during our last break on Twitter. Um, quote, Girl Scout cookie sales might never be the same should young entrepreneurs discover business is much better in front of marijuana dispensaries than supermarket doors. <laughs> Proof that policy makes a difference in the states. Federalism is a vast battleground, so vast it's almost hiding in plain sight. In Missouri, we've seen it play out in the rise and, and now the beginning of the fall of a petty tyrant. Maybe that is a lesson for the national level. We'll see. Here, in, in the case of Missouri, elites have been turning against that despot, and that's what I think the key is, as was mentioned with um, Joe McCarthy. Does American federalism promote democracy? The historical record is equivocal. States have nurtured democracy and they have choked it. Is it a guardrail for democracy? Unequivocally, yes. American federalism is a tool for resisting national despotism. Political opposition is necessary for democracy and federalism ensures that the opposition can use independent governing institutions to challenge a regime in national power. But to advance American democracy today, a very strong, organized, durable, and national political movement is essential to use this tool to achieve substantive democratic reforms. Federalism, as Aaron Woldowski wrote, is all about inequality. States do things differently, and those differences allow for different citizenship rights and different politics in each state. You know a government is independent if it can legitimately terminate a citizen's life. Some states don't do that. Texas does it with some enthusiasm. So it's very uh, important to note that if that is subject to state control, a whole lot of other things that are important to citizenship also are important. The boundary between national and state authority is ambiguous, not surprising. The Constitution was written by practicing politicians, not by angels or saints or philosophers or constitutional lawyers or, thank God, by political scientists. These were dedicated Republicans, the best Republican politicians in the world. 
They wrote the Constitution for future Republicans to use, including people they knew to be demagogues, which have been a constant in political history across the world. They wrote the Constitution in a way that showed their skills in strategic compromise and ambiguity and evasion, just like politicians today. So if you're looking for the framers' original intent to set the due limits of national power and democracy, you are on a fool's errand. These men did not agree on those limits. They left that task to the politicians. Some in that room very quickly fought to expand national authority, and some fought just as hard to resist that expansion. It's true that in the Federalist, James Madison argued that federalism can protect Republican government from despotism. But in an earlier paper, Madison also argued for the national government as a Republican defense because small homogenous domains like the states pose their own threat to Republican government. And Robert Mickey can tell you all about that. In these small geographical areas, powerful majorities more easily squash opponents than they can in a larger, more diverse nation nationwide forum. So Madison's later defense of states against national power may depend on uh, the power of despotic officials that already have violated Republican principles in suppressing their opponents. This reality stared him in the face when he walked out the back of his dad's plantation house in Virginia. The quality of democracy is always different across the states. They pursued different and unequal rules for voting. They did that long before 1787. They evaded this problem, the framers did, by institutionalizing it, putting diverse electoral rules into the rules of the Constitution for electing U.S. representatives and the state legislators who were going to choose U.S. senators and presidential electors. So, if the states uh, are not uh, providing the benefits of structural democracy, can they at least serve as laboratories for democracy? After all, the most important American democratic experiments all were initiated at the state and local level. But remember, some laboratories work on cancer cures and other laboratories stitch together Frankenstein. So, just in the United States, we have a plentiful historical record of that distinction. The record for democracy in the states is very equivocal. Some state government experiments have expanded it, others have restricted it. States, after all, are not pure laboratories with a full range of supplies. The Constitution limits state commercial powers and without the power to protect their internal producers. Their policies strongly have biased states toward policy experiments that advantage them in economic competition. Democracy can stand in the way, um, to fit in with Robert Kuttner's argument, uh, and when it stands in the way of uh, profits for capitalist development, states can dilute it. Certainly states pioneered the expansion of franchise for white guys uh, in the, by the 1840s. Women. Uh, adeptly utilized federalism to win the franchise for themselves. But sta state laboratories of anti-democracy have produced many equally successful experiments. And we know them from the uh, experiments in the southern states in the late 1800s and into the early 20th century on disenfranchising blacks with literacy and citizenship tests, poll taxes, and grandfather clauses. Northern and Western states also experimented with property requirements, registration, and residency laws to restrict the participation of urban working class voters and especially immigrants. Today's state experiments in democracy are just as equivocal. Some states provide for automatic and same-day voter registration. Others, as we know, have imposed photo ID requirements that limit voting by minorities and the poor who cannot and do not uh, uh, find it possible to afford a photo ID. Uh, 
So the argument for states as laboratories of democracy is not convincing without a set of national rules to provide a baseline for preventing majorities within a state from repressing democracy within it. But if federalism does not promote democracy, it unequivocally presents an institutional barrier to national authoritarianism. Democracy requires opposition to the ruling regime. Authoritarian regimes concentrate on destroying their political opponents, and they alter political institutions to facilitate that destruction. Federalism protects a viable political opposition to the an opposition to those who are holding national power because it provides an independent uh, set of institutions that opponents of a national regime can use to challenge national leaders. We saw it during the Obama administration and in the um, uh, Trump administration. No president can fire an American state governor or dissolve a state legislature. Russian President Vladimir Putin has done both, smothering a crucial power base for political opponents and extending the reach of authoritarian rule. American federalism always has established a base for the opposition to national rules, including in the 1850s when northern states decided to basically nullify the Fugitive Slave Act and refused to enforce it when told to do that. States even have revived nullification to battle federal laws on immigration and gun control and uh, on the clean power plan of the Obama administration. So federalism unequivocally forms a fortification against authoritarian national regimes. American federalism can further democracy if some things are done. First, strong, durable national coalitions have to demand the expansion of democracy state by state. Federalism is a battlefield that requires a kind of mobilization and strategy that drove the success of women's suffrage, prohibition, and civil rights. The, lip, the federal system is a strong barrier to national cooperation because it fragments tactics and achievements, wearing down national advocacy. Progressives have to plan to surmount these barriers to cooperation so they can push back against limitations on democracy across all the states. A federated nation cannot allow state partisans pursuing a political advantage to restrict democracy like secretaries of state. Proponents of democracy have to seize on the efforts of states and local governments to deepen American democracy. And state democracy reforms like these are practical and more important, they can achieve results. Successes provide the glue that any democratic government will require. That determined, durable movement is necessary for advancing democracy on the battlefield of American federalism. Thanks. set up for laptops, but that's where my notes are, so hopefully this will work. Um, so I have 10 minutes and um, three really different, um, expansive, non-overlapping papers, so um, sadly no time for jokes um, and uh, not much time for thanks other than um, what a wonderful conference. I mean, there's so, so many brilliant people in this room. I'm really, really uh, delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to say just a minute two minutes about each of the three papers and then try to make, develop quickly one uh, 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 point about some, at least some connections between the King-Smith paper and um, the introduction to the Kuttner book, which I'm looking forward to reading the, the whole book for, uh, uh, related to how we think about economic inequality and growing economic inequality and the challenges that we're facing. So first, uh, Dave's uh, paper on federalism, um, unsurprisingly, uh, given that he's, you know, one of the one of the greatest scholars we have about American federalism, it's full of wisdom. Um, but I want to just very quickly push back on this phrase: federalism unequivocally stands as an institutional barrier to national authoritarianism. Uh, I think we really need to think about how state and national politics and political organizations interact in our contemporary polarized period. Um, just to highlight a couple of books. Um, Dave Hopkins' new book, Red Fighting Blue, 
um, which I think is really brilliant on, on thinking about those issues, and Alex Hertel Fernandez's forthcoming book, State Capture, which looks at Alec and Americans for Prosperity uh, and their role in sort of nationalizing political contestation uh, within states where they have opportunities. Uh, and uh, in this context, and you could say North Carolina might be a prototype for this, the way in which a very purple state can generate extreme uh, policies. Wisconsin would be another example of this. Um, in the current environment, states can actually be incubators for extremism. Right? And there are, there are a few uh, uh, indicators of that in, in your paper, but I think I, I would make that point much more strongly, um, that the way in which states interact with national politics in our highly polarized and highly organized politics um, means that uh, states are much less likely, I think, in, to be instruments of diversity um, and, and political countervailing power and often can actually be important motors uh, for producing more extremism. Uh, Des um, and um, Roger's paper on racial divisions, I want to just underscore, I think, two really important themes in this paper, which builds on their earlier work, work which I, I, say, I have to say resonates with me more and more um, every day. Certainly um, since um, the 2016 election, I'm, I'm more and more appreciative of the wisdom of what, they, what they've been doing. Uh, the two, two themes. Um, that I think are, are important to emphasize in what they're saying. One is the buildup to Trumpism's racial politics has been a long process. Right? I mean, we really need to think a lot about um, the dynamics that have produced this, particularly within the GOP and the way uh, in which uh, that party has, has developed around issues of race over a very extended period of time. This didn't come uh, uh, from nowhere. Um, and secondly, is the second theme is their emphasis on the centrality of coalitions, right? uh, of organized societal actors in the fashioning of racial politics. I'm very much along the lines of what Theda was saying earlier, that we should not think about citizens as like potatoes in a sack. Right? Um, we need to think about uh, the ways in which some you know, often pretty inchoate sets of preferences um, or impressions Right, um, get organized into particular kinds of politics, and I think the work that you guys are doing is very, power is very powerful on that front. Um, I do want to say something in a minute, after I said something about Bob, about the way that you guys talk about, is it race or is it class, right? Um, which is a sort of standard in, in thinking about Trumpism, and I think there is a lot, I think there is, you're in strong ground, from what I understand of the survey research, in suggesting that if you are trying to figure out, you know, which are the things that seem to be triggers, Right, for higher levels of Trump support, I think there is a lot of reason to think that racial animus um, trumps class, right? Um, but I actually, th I'm not convinced that that's the right way or the best way to, to think about it, that we need to decide that one is primary one and one is secondary. Instead, we should think about how they're intertwined. I'm gonna just come back to that, okay? So uh, economic inequality. Um, well, I, I agree with Bob Kuttner about most things. Um, he's, of course, right to emphasize that the shift of economic power is profound. Uh, and fundamental and generates massive challenges to democratic governance. Um, haven't read the book yet, looking forward to it. I, I will just say in passing, because I want to say something direct, directly about that, I do wonder whether, uh, so yes, globalization, yes, global capitalism, but also profound technological change, right? I, and, I, and I think that, um, that that also has to be part of our understanding uh, of what has happened. Um, uh, in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, manufacturing is, in a lot of ways, what's happened to manufacturing is what happened to agriculture. Right? That's putting it a little bit, a little bit starkly in terms of uh, job generation. And that's, uh, it's con obviously connected to global capitalism, but it is, um, it's also profoundly uh, connected to really radical uh, technological change. Uh, so, but I, I wanted to shift in thinking about economic inequality and the shift in the balance of economic power, uh, I wanted to say a little bit about how we think about how that plays out in particular countries, right? even though this is uh, clearly a cross-national phenomenon in import important respects, and I want to talk about how it plays out in this particular country. Um, so, uh, and I think that we actually, in wrestling with what Trumpism is, uh, that we have struggled uh, to do that to really think about where economic inequality and growing economic inequality fits in the story. Uh, the standard way in which it's brought into the discussion 
is to focus on the white working class, right? The left behinds. Um, and I don't want to say that that isn't important. It's really important. But I don't think it's really the key, actually, for bringing uh, economic inequality into the discussion. At least as important has been the growing power and increasingly distinctive and often anti-democratic interests within the ranks of the very wealthy and a growing part of corporate America. Right? So <laughs> look at what's going on with the people who do have power right? uh, and have had growing uh, organizational power. So the U.S. is experiencing, and here the U.S. is actually distinctive to right-wing populisms elsewhere in important ways. The U.S. is experiencing what Jacob Hacker and I are calling plutocratic populism. Right? Populists, including ethno-nationalist forces, are part of a political coalition with plutocrats. We cannot understand Trumpism or the modern GOP, and I agree again with Theta, uh, that we should be spending a lot of time thinking about what has happened to the Republican Party uh, without recognizing the centrality of that alliance. All right. Two uh, important implications. There are more, but I barely have time to talk about two. Okay. Um, well, the first, if you think about plutocratic populism, all right, well before Trump appeared on the scene, the organized National Republican Party had embraced a stark plutocratic economic agenda. That agenda is unparalleled among major parties in other advanced democracies. Right? This helps to explain the strength of the establishment, the strength of the establishment Republican Party's attachment to Trump and its willingness to ignore or even provide cover for his authoritarian impulses. They are getting a lot from him. Right? Mitch McConnell recently said, 2017 was the best year for conservatives right, in my lifetime. Right? They got the Supreme Court, they got a massive tax cut, and though the jury's out, they're getting a lot of deregulation. Right? Uh, the Huguenot Henry IV famously said once, Paris is worth a mass. Right? Paul Ryan might have said, tax cuts are worth Charlottesville. Second point, that plutocratic agenda is hugely unpopular. Hugely unpopular uh, plutocratic agenda, right? It is really striking that the two major pieces of legislation that Republicans tried to pass pulled in the 20s. There is no precedent for that. No precedent, right? Um, this is really consequential, right? They really want to do things that are really unpopular. So let me start by putting it abstractly. If you're going to get killed on one political cleavage, you'd better have a plan of advancing another political cleavage. All right. I really want to recommend, so here's my one way to compare to this, Daniel Ziblatt's recent book on conservative parties and democratization. Great book. All right. And he argues that the reality of economic inequality is an intrinsic part of the challenge facing conservative parties who are trying to compete in democratic politics. And he argues they have to, they are driven to introduce other lines of cleavage. Nationalism, race, ethnicity, religion, because they're probably not going to win on a, pure, uh, on a pure economic cleavage, right? The task they face in a democracy is to incorporate those additional cleavages in a moderate constrain, constrained way rather than getting captured by extremists. And he tries to explore the circumstances under which historically they were or were not able to do that. Now, um, as Danny Schlossman argues in his paper for the, for the conference, the Republican Party has failed to manage that challenge. Right? It has actually been captured by two sets of extreme forces, extreme ethno-nationalists and extreme plutocrats. Right? So the rise of economic inequality and the fomenting of racial animus are inextricably linked, right? As Jacob said to me, um, and I don't think I've seen this anywhere else, let them eat tweets. <laughs> let them eat tweets, right? The less you are going to do to address the economic needs of people, the more you had better do to activate their other political act uh, identities. So we uh, need to 
finish this up by 1220, so I actually don't know names, so I'm going to point to people. Um, I'm going to do it in order. Um, I'm going to point to you, tell me your name, and then we'll get back to you. So in the back. Way in the back. Go, go ahead. Trumpism, Trumpism and, and, and race and inequality, uh, and, and whether this is a new thing, right? There was some discussion about that. I, I migrated to the U.S. in 2000, shortly after 9-11 happened. I was doing my bachelor's in El Paso, and then I had to go scan my, my iris every other month because we were all at red. And then in 2006, we participated in these massive marches uh, because there was this very racist... Uh, law that was about to, or proposed at least, and then, and then I started grad school, and then I, uh, yesterday I remember, as a lot of people were sort of remembering what they were discussing in grad school, I remember that I sort of also was discussing all of those things. So I guess for me the question is, I've seen these things happening at least since I've been here, right, since 2000. Uh, ask me about Mexico prior to that. But for me at least, I've seen this since 2000. It's not, not, not really nothing new has happened. The only thing that has happened, and that's, and that's where my question comes, is whether Trumpism really is not a thing, but just the visualization of all those other things. And if that's the case, what kind of sort of, what are we trying to reestablish? Is it just the not acknowledging of all those things that seem to be already happening, that at least in my view have happened since at least 2000? Okay. Do you? All right, so let's do. Three more questions. I think Valerie, um, Larry, Dee Dee, and Sid. Because those oh, was that four? Oh, sorry. That's why I do APD. Sorry. I'll be brief. It's just a it's just a a question for Bob Cutner. Um, I don't know. I've read the book obviously, and I don't know. There's an old argument whether it's in the book, but there's an old argument in the political economy literature about capitalism behaving itself more when it had an international competitor, which is to say communism. Um, and, and that capitalism unfettered, I mean capitalism in a way with the collapse of communism established a global monopoly. Um, and so that kind of pressure, you know, we could all talk, I think there's a lot of work on this in the 1930s, but there are also issues as the Cold War, you know, you know begins to heat, you know, hold up <laughs> uh, by 1947-48. Um, and, and I just wonder about that, because earlier someone made a comment, which I think is right, that maybe it was Elliot, um, that at the end of the Cold War, we didn't really have much of a discussion about how to rethink the international order. Uh, that we kind of just slid into this other thing where you, know, you basically had a unipolar world order, blah, blah, blah. So, so I'm wondering about this from a political economy perspective. That, that at least some of our story about inequality, some of our story about what's happened with capitalism unfettered, has to do with the fact that it no longer has a competitor. Great. Actually, actually, let's do the... So Larry, next. And if you could keep the questions kind of brief. Thanks. For Des King, uh, one of the themes uh, today is, and maybe yesterday, was how President Trump has been tamed by either his advisors or Congress. And um, I'm just curious, uh, given the racialization of uh, policy uh, that you track in your paper, do you think Donald Trump has been tamed? Didi. Great panel, thank you so much. So my question is about this, the response of the left or the center left across all advanced democracies. We've had the secular decline of social democracy in Europe, as Sherry Berman has written about. We clearly don't have a response after third wave politics and centrism of the 1990s in the US or in many other globally capitalized advanced democracies. And we therefore have very little institutional capacity to regulate global capitalism. Um, where do you think that a left response can really come from, not Bernie Sanders? Right. And then actually, Sid, right? Did someone over here? Did you have? No. What Sid? Oh, this Sid. Sorry. Sorry, Sydney. Sydney, uh, Sid. Sorry. Okay. Uh, one point for David. 
Uh, I've been looking at uh, legislative proposals in state legislatures since before Trump's election. I recommend you look at it. Uh, 25 states have had at least proposals in one house and some of them in two houses against Black Lives Matter protests and against anti-Trump protests. North Dakota has a legislative proposal that somebody who drives his car into a protester by accident is not liable. And many of these bills look like that. Um, for Des, uh, it's a question that came up when I read the book, and I'm even more struck by it now. What's the operative meaning of your term alliance? Does alliance mean that there is a checklist of groups and individuals who fit on one side of a typology or the other, or does it mean it's a coalition? And uh, looking at the uh, the, the right-wing coalition you talk about, it strikes me that it's much more closely as, uh, looking like a network than a loose alliance. And looking at the pro-minority uh, uh, alliance, it looks much less like a coherent network and much more like a spectrum of only loosely connected or not connected groups at all. Panelists? Yeah, I'd like this, to start. Is this working? Yeah, good. Uh, thanks so much for these, for these um, questions and comments. Um, uh, I want to start with something Paul said, which is about the, um, his, his final comments about the mixture of extreme ethno-nationalism and extreme plutocracy as being the GOP base. I'm not co yet convinced about that. Um, it's... I didn't say this in presentation, but it seems to me Trump has purposefully developed a white nationalist identity, which has got lots of historical resonance in America. But it's been a very deliberate strategy for 10 years. Um, we see it in the Bertha movement and in the way the Tea Party movement developed. I don't know if there are any African-American members of the Tea Party. I haven't seen very many in the rallies or photographs. And the way in which Black Lives Matter was characterized by the Trump um, wing in the, the years preceding it. Um, and we've had a significant change here because the, the, the opinion polls in 2008 were, were much more positive about um, uh, so-called uh, race um, issues in the US than they are now. They've gone down. So I think there's something there that's been, that's been um, fostered and fanned. He has presented himself as the person representing a particular part of the population. I, and I find this a huge flaw in all this ethnographic work by Kramer, Arlie Hochschild, the hillbilly guy, all this stuff, <laughs> Janesville, all these things. Um, and they, they, they don't confront this issue centrally. Janesville, which I think is an excellent descriptive book, it doesn't really have an analytical element in it. Think about it in terms of racial divisions and who is the rep I don't know if you know this book. It's about Wisconsin, Paul Ryan's district by Amy Gilstein. It's, it's, it's really quite good on its own terms, but it's, it's very flawed. So I see a much more powerful white nationalist identity which has been mobilized in the Trump coalition, in the colorblind opposition to, uh, to policies than, than, um, than the plutocrats yet. Um, you have to. So, I'm sorry, okay. The, in terms of Larry's question, is, is, is Trump constrained? No, I don't think he, he's remotely constrained. I think one of the best sources for this is to read um, Lunch with the, FT, with the Financial Times on Saturdays. They do a big lunch with somebody, and they've got a good habit of picking very rich Americans, like Chris Ruddy, for instance, who are close to the president. And the views that are expressed in there are really quite interesting. And they, are not, they don't really see Bannon as being so um, uh, out of sync with the, um, with the views that are there. Um, and then the coalition regime one, is that's a big question, Sid, and we've, we've always had that so far. The, the, the perp we're not saying these groups work coordinatedly together. We are saying that when there's a, uh, a key policy issue bearing on civil rights, we can put groups and um, uh, organizations into these two different sides. Sorry. Okay, great. Uh, is, it, is this on? It should be on. So, um, great comments. Let me start out with, uh, with Paul's comments. Um, First, on technology, um, there's a nice line by Tom Frank, someone who I disagree with more than I agree with him, but I, I agree with him on this. He said, technology, 
is not the driver of inequality technology. It's the excuse for not doing anything about it. And I think if you look at uh, World War II, there was a burst of technology that coincided with an era of increased uh, egalitarian income distribution. Um, on the question of, of plutocratic populism, which is a marvelous phrase, the, the only comment I'd make is that it's not that novel. If you look at Mussolini, if you look at Hitler's alliance with Deutsche Bank, with Farben, with the, the, the German captains of industry, this weirdly anomalous uh, ability of angry voters to look the other way when the dictator has alliances with oligarchs or kleptocrats, Putin being exhibit B. Uh, so yes, it absolutely describes what's going on with Trump, but, but uh, it's not uh, unique. Um, and uh, on the question of race, I think what the neo-fascist right has done in every country it is to racialize or otherize economic grievance. And yes, this is an old story in the United States. It's certainly uh, the current incarnation is as recent as, as the Wallace vote uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. And um, the populace tends to be more open-hearted to others, witness the civil rights era, when its livelihood is not being taken away and so there is an interplay between class resentment and, and race uh, resentment. Um, on the question, which is a very good question, about competition and capitalism, um, two answers to that. Number one, the harnessing of capitalism in the broad public interest begins in the New Deal and World War II and at Bretton Woods. And the West's role vis-a-vis -vis Russia was ambiguous at that point. The Cold War doesn't harden until 46, 48. Then the Cold War gives the United States an excuse to be more statist than it usually is. And it gives the United States, which is reverting to a more conservative government after, after ideology, after Roosevelt dies, and certainly after Taft-Hartley and all that stuff. But diplomatically, the United States is very indulgent of European Social Democrats because they're part of the anti-communist uh, bulwark. Uh, so that's a piece of the truth. And I think your other point is absolutely right, that, that after 1989, there was no serious effort to reset the global order. The assumption was everybody would become more like us. And uh, liberal, liberal democracy, liberal capitalism would march on splendidly together. And this did not happen, that the proliferation of capitalism became anti-democratic and then uh, stimulated anti-democratic backlash. Uh, and Clinton, Blair, Schroeder in the 90s, by being part of the globalist coalition that really didn't give a damn about working people for the most part, um, that left a vacuum for neo-fascists to fill when the whole thing fell apart. You know, where, uh, where Robert, I'm going to have to. And, and I, I think what's the remedy for this I think it's a kind of positive nationalism that the, the Swedes in the 30s defined, that Roosevelt defined, that Macron in his own way is trying to define, that says, we're not going to hate foreigners. We're just going to make this a better place for Americans. Well, on federalism, I, I welcome Paul's comments and challenge the uh, idea that the states are kind of a bulwark against authoritarianism because they protect political opposition. I see political opposition as a key to democracy and the protection of it as essential. And federalism has done that in the United States. I'm not saying it works in a progressive direction. Far from it. Look at the Obama administration. Scott Pruitt, uh, you know, earned his chops challenging Obama on everything. Think about that picture of Governor Jan Brewer of Arizona lecturing the President of the United States on the tarmac in Arizona. That's what is the sort of um, uh, unreducible element of democracy that I think is critical. But that doesn't mean it's going to turn out the right way. It, it probably won't in all cases in the way I would want it to do. That's the breaks. That's the rules. What we need to do is a smart 
discussion of what things have to be national to protect democracy. And that, whatever we con conclusion we come to, has to be pushed forward in all the states. I would say national versus international, as well as national versus state. Okay. All right. Oh, um, so we actually have like two more minutes. So, Paul, if you want to just be really quick, and I, does I anyone Valerie's else have any other questions? point is really questions? important, uh, and the, the only thing that I would add there is that the end of the Cold War didn't just have an effect on how capitalism operated and um, the need to, say, legitimate it, but it also had an effect on the GOP. And I think, you know, and the, it, released, it, 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 it released the capacity to develop these sort of intense anti-Washington, anti-statist, anti-institutionalist, uh, arguments that were at least somewhat checked um, prior, to the, prior to the end of the Cold War. Des, I, I don't disagree with anything you say. I don't think it's at all inconsistent with what I, what I was saying, right? That, that there is an alliance actually in one of the obituaries of Paul Ryan yesterday, there was this passage from a Politico reporter, which I thought was quite interesting, where he said, um, we're in a coalition, he had, he had said, Ryan had said, we're in a coalition government, right? Without the efficiency of a parliamentary system. Right, and so, but I think that coalitional element for a variety of reasons, and of course, you know, I mean, uh, Trump has just, uh, I mean, uh, he is a plutocrat, right, and he was happy to, to just cede control over domestic policy within the executive branch and within the congressional agenda to, uh, to other plutocrats who are, who are aligned with other elements of the Republican Party. So I, so I think there's, there's just a really important interplay uh, between these dimensions, and, then, and yeah, Bob, it's, uh, it isn't new. Right, and I, I just so I had the kind of creepy experience, lovely in a lot of ways. I shared an office with Dan Ziblatt when he was finishing his book on the history of conservatism and democracy. When I was working on the chapter on the evolution of business groups in the U.S. in American amnesia, and we were pointing to the parallels, right, of the way I mean, in a way that was a little bit unsettling between the kinds of alliances that developed on the right in Germany uh, in the 1920s and early 1930s. Uh, and the kinds of alliances that were developing in the right in, in the United States. Uh, so, um, and so that, you know, the, and, and, you know, economic elites are a really important part of that story. All right, Robert, you had a, Rob Mickey. Did, one, one, one more question. Uh, so for Des and David, um, just coming back to Paul's Worry about federalism, I wonder if you could talk about the prospects of the nationalization of state level racialized policy, something here of like Alex voter ID bill, right? So Kobox Commission is is about something, you know, developed in the laboratories of the state trying to go national. And while a congressional statute might be unlikely, you know, even just the nationwide legitimation of a moral panic about voter fraud is a very dangerous thing, too. I think it would be hard to pass a direct national law. I can't conceive of this, but in theory, you could uh, write a law that would, that would give states an additional advantage of economic competition that would give them an incentive to pass up a law themselves. That's my first reaction. Was there another question? Uh, Jamila, Theta, Jamila, and I think that's kind of it, right? Because we're almost out of, we are out of time. Uh, so, Theta. Uh, I just want to challenge Des not to reduce Trump only to the voter base, um, the core of his voter base. Uh, there absolutely is a twin, uh, a fusion in the Trump administration of organized plutocratic power following an extreme and unpopular economic agenda, and that power has been building since the early 2000s with long-standing Republican willingness to play with the fire of hatred of immigrants and people of color. That fusion probably has a name. I actually don't want to give it that name, but that, it's just not one thing because otherwise you can't explain why Trump mm -hmm. handed much of his domestic administration outside of the Justice Department and Homeland Security 
to Koch network operatives. All right, Jamila, do you want to make one comment, last comment, question? Oh, yes, I always forget about this. Okay, I guess I keep thinking about this panel and the last panel, right? Even thinking about the titles of the panels. So the last panel is about the linkages between citizens and government, and this one is about inequality in institutions. And I guess the comment that I wanted to make was that it would be useful to connect these notions, right? So, you know, given what you talked about, Des, which is so important, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm thankful that in the midst of a broad, optimistic story that's been emerging for many people, to think about this from the vantage point of civil rights and policies that are most relevant in the lives of people of color and to see that the picture isn't as rosy is important. But when we think about things like policing, affirmative action, schooling, housing, the census, the things that you brought up, right? Um, and, and even when we think about federalism, so connecting those broad policy and institutional um, patterns to what that means for the relationship between citizens and government, right? So taking the institutional lens um, and taking the sort of more grounded lens that, uh, that's kind of more overtly about political engagement and participation and thinking about how those things speak to each other strikes me as an important intersection. And even though these are separate panels, I hope that we're, we're trying to imagine what these things mean for, for each other. So that's it. Great, thank you. Okay, before we break, first of all, just um, thanks to everyone, all the panelists, all of our participants for a great morning. Let me just do a little bit of choreography. Lunch is available outside, right by the live feed from the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, so uh, get your lunch, enjoy a bit of a break. We'll reconvene here at 1 o'clock for a keynote address from Jennifer Rubin. So thanks again for a great morning.